use theirs and we'll take them to the restaurant afterwards. I just want to make sure we have enough lunches for everyone. All right, let's get started. We've got a lot of ground to cover. We've got thousands of years of traditions on this stage. So we better buckle up our seats. So most of you have, have seen me along the way. My name's Renee Barabo. Oh, make sure the lives hit. Vanessa, would you hit the live? I'm not sure. Oh, someone's going to hit it. We're actually taking this session live on Facebook. So we're, we'll invite you to share it widely with your friends afterwards. And we are really excited about this afternoon lunch panel. And a couple of just quick housekeeping messages. So the exhibitor hall will close after the 2.30 break. And at the 2.30 break, we're giving away our grand prize, which is an Oculus. So you want to be there for some more chances to win gift cards and maybe take yourself and win that VR into an alternate reality. All right. So settle down and here we go. I'm, I'm very excited to introduce my dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Lauren Costein. We'll actually be presenting together at the West Coast Symposium. We've done a lot of panel, we've done a lot of co promoting, uh, co presenting. Co presenting. Uh, so we want to welcome you to our Lunch and Learn discussion on integrating spirituality into psychotherapy. Our fabulous moderator, Lauren Costein. Uh, Dr. Costein is a licensed psychologist, consultant, author, educator, and international speaker. She co-hosts a podcast about the intersection between psychology and social justice issue. She's writing her second book and is the co-founder and clinical director of Awakened Therapy Center serving all of California, and her, her partner in that um, great endeavor, and they're out in the valley, is uh, her wife, Vanessa Friedman, and we want to welcome you here today as well. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. Um, Thank you for that introduction. And I'm so, I'm actually really honored to be facilitating this important and timely discussion today. Um, spirituality is very close to my heart, so I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say. Um, but I'd first like to introduce uh, all of our panelists. And first to the, my far left is Dr. Armbradar. Dr. Sheeni Armbradar, MD, specializes in adult psychiatry with expertise in psychopharmacologic medication management as well as psychotherapy. Dr. Armbadar is the founder of The Happiness Psychiatrist, an award-winning psychiatry practice in Los Angeles. Her unique treatment method blends modern medicine with ancient Hindu and Buddhist spiritual philosophies. She uses low-dose medications in conjunction with an eclectic blend of psychotherapeutic modalities, including psychodynamic, therapy, walking therapy, journal therapy, meditation, and kundalini yoga. Dr. Armbradar is also a mental health advocate, human rights activist, activist, and writer. She has been published in the New York Times and the Huffington Post, has been interviewed by the Washington Post, Good Housekeeping, Shape, and Women's Health for her psychiatric insights. And then Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt is in the middle. Known for her holistic approach to psychiatry, Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt is the CEO of Within Health and Galen Mental Health, where she provides and oversees psychiatric assessments and treatment, a variety of psychological modalities of care, functional and integrative medicine, and traditional medical interven interventions to treat a broad spectrum of disorders. She has held faculty positions at New York University, Albert Einstein School of Medicine, and University of Nevada School of Medicine. Dr. Oliver Pyatt was the medical director for the State of Nevada Division of Mental Health and Disability Services, where she created a holistic, whole person approach to mental health care. A leader in the field of eating disorders, Dr. Oliver Pyatt serves on the board of directors of the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals and is current chair of the board of directors of the Binge Eating Disorder Association. And last but not least, J.D. Kalmanson. J.D. Kalmanson is the founder and CEO of multiple behavioral health care companies in Southern California and Arizona, 
including Monterra Behavioral Health, our sponsor for this event. Commonson hosts a bi-weekly podcast for Monterra Media called Discover You, which highlights complex mental health and chemical dependency issues. Always interested in broadening and deepening the industry standard, Kalmanson is the creator of a cutting edge diagnostic tool for chemical dependency issues called the Discovery Model. He is a Yale Shabab scholar, a skilled facilitator, teacher, counselor, and speaker who has previously provided chaplain services to prisons and remote villages throughout the world. His diverse experience as a rabbi, chaplain, and CEO has inspired his passion and deep understanding of the necessity for effective mental health treatment and long-term sobriety. Please welcome our distinguished panel. So we have very limited time together. I'd really like to jump in with our first question, and hopefully we will have time for some audience participation at the end of our time together. So I'd like to start with hearing from each one of you for this first question, which is, how do you define spirituality? Um, Dr. Ambedar, would you please go first? Okay. Um, so obviously it's a very deeply personal question and everyone you know, is gonna answer it differently. So for me personally, I would say it's a few different things. It's about really connecting to who I am, like my spirit, my soul. Um, really connecting to my intuition, um, awakening kind of an inner intelligence, um, having the courage to know who you are and then be who you are. So express your authentic self in the real world. Um, and it's not so easy to do that as I'm sure we all know, right? It's not so easy to listen to your heart or follow your heart. So to me, that's a really crucial part of spirituality. So it's about kind of awakening your spirit, that soul. And then another part of spirituality for me is just kind of pondering, you know, the cosmos, the universe, you know, all the galaxies, the stars, the planets, the suns. I mean, it's just amazing if you think about it, you know, what makes all of this go round? What force or energy is behind all of this? So, you know, obviously I don't think about that every day, but um, <laughs> when you do really ponder that, I think it, um, you know, it really makes you ask what is our relationship to that force or that creative energy? And how can we connect to that in some meaningful way? So I guess that's what it means to me. Lovely, thank you. Dr. Wendy. Um, so for me, just being invited to do this um, panel, it was sort of interesting for me because I sometimes share, not a lot share, that I'm a child of a Holocaust survivor. And one of the ways that my father adapted to what he went through was he became really like an extreme atheist. So I was brought up along the continuum of cynicism versus faith, I was brought up with the idea of cynicism and sort of an eye rolling. Even we didn't, we didn't even get to believe in Santa Claus in, in my um, home and I was in Carson City, Nevada. So I have always felt sort of a yearning and a desire to have more connection to what spirituality is. Um, and so one of the things that I do for myself um, is I think of the concept of choosing the loving behavior. So I talked with my patients about CTLB. So if I don't myself kind of just have that sort of feeling of mysticism or transcendence, that might be something that you could feel um, if you're in a spiritual state, is to choose the loving behavior. So loving behavior, loving kindness, loving kindness toward myself, loving kindness towards others. And then there's that, that phrase like entering into the world of the spirit. And I think that's also very interesting because it implies that there's action. So instead of just thinking of spirituality as like a feeling, I like to think of it for myself as like an action. So I don't feel as helpless necessarily about the fact that I, I, I feel like spirituality is sort of like a muscle that can be cultivated and grown. Um, and so that's what I sort of try to do um, for myself. I think one of the other things that's tied in with spirituality is the concept of contentment. I love the word content because it means, to me, it means you're okay with what you have, like whatever part you have. So you could have a lot of people that have a lot of stuff and don't necessarily you know, have contentment. And I think spirituality and contentment are like very intertwined. Um, so I, I like the idea of loving kindness, contentment, 
And I think also curiosity and openness to the reality of the miracle of life mm. is something that really excites me. I, I like to read about near um, death experiences and the commonalities among those who have near death experiences. And then one of the, the couple other things that comforts me um, are that when I've been really pushed to the end of my rope, as far as something really, when my son had a serious medical problem, I found that I moved into prayer. Mm -hmm. I literally would go downstairs, get in front of my fireplace, get on my knees and pray. And like, I was not taught to pray, but that instinct came over me. And I just found that very interesting that like something inside of me called for higher power, if you will. That kind of comforts me when I think about spirituality. Also, growing up in um, Nevada, I had a lot of friends that I, I was, you know, like this daughter of a Holocaust survivor living in a town where it was like Julianne, Marianne, Shirley Ann, and everybody was Christian. I'm not kidding. And I was Wendy Fried, as you know. So my dad gave me his sister's middle name. So I always felt like an anomaly. But when I was um, 12 or 13, I actually got baptized with one of my friends. Her, um, my friend Desiree, her, her father was um, involved in church, and I, had and I had a very transcendent experience when mm -hmm. I got baptized. I, I had this like wave of like euphoria and calmness, and so I, that always comforts me. And then the last thing that comforts me, well, there's a long list, but I'm <laughs> here all day, but the, one, another thing that comforts me is that my dad, who was like hardcore, you know, atheist, and we couldn't have, you know, no such thing as Santa Claus type of thing, now that he's 94 years old and more in touch with his own mortality, he and I now talk about the presence of miracles in everyday life, and that's very comforting to me. So those are just some of the ways I personally describe spirituality, and I really do hope that we have time at the end because I'm, this is such an interesting subject that I would love to hear from the audience also. Thank you. JD, please. Thank you. And, uh, First and foremost, I want to start by saying that definitely everything that you've said resonates with me personally. Um, if any of you have ever been to Israel and you ask somebody for directions, you get a funny response. So you're going to see that there's a right. Don't take the right, take a left. So let me begin by first sharing what spirituality does not have to be. Uh, they say a story about a fellow who him and his wife, Sammy and Sadie, they were in their late 80s, very health conscious. They were meticulous about their daily exercise routine, you know, only organic, vegan, you know, on, on multiple different uh, diets. And one day they're crossing the street and tragically they're hit by a car and they both die. And they come up to heaven and Peter the angel welcomes them. And he shows them to this gorgeous palatial home overlooking the ocean, and Sammy starts getting fidgety, and he says, uh, how much is this going to cost? Mm -hmm. And Peter says, no, it's heaven. This, mm -hmm. this doesn't cost anything. It's, it's on the house. <laughs> so, okay, they come in, and then they see this magnificent array of exotic delicacies of every, you know, imaginable origin. And... Sammy says, you know, sorry, Peter, but we're, we're, where's the organic section? You know, Sadie and I, we're, we're very con And he says, Peter says, no. Mm -hmm. Sam, you don't get it. This is heaven. It will not harm you. <laughs> there will be no detrimental effect. And now Sammy is really frustrated, and he turns to Sadie, and he says, you and your brand muffins, we could have been here 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, let's just outline right up front, spirituality is not does not have to be about heaven, and it does not have to be manifest in any type of traditional dogma or religious definition. It is something that is what we believe to be universal. And what I'd like to do just for a couple of minutes is you all have a paper on the table in front of you, and this is a spirituality assessment exercise. But before we jump into it, I want to just point out another expression of spirituality. People tend to conflate and confuse two terms, influence and power. Because in society, most people who are powerful or influential, and we associate those who are very influential as being powerful. But they cannot be further from the, that cannot, they cannot be further apart from each other. Because suppose 
I take 90% of your power and I distribute it to nine other people. I have removed 90% of your power. But suppose I take your influence and I spread it to nine other people. I've multiplied your influence by 90%. And you find in a lot of spiritual literature talk about the soul being connected to the candle. And you think about the candle. We all innately can appreciate the comfort of a candle, the warmth, the glow. And when you think about it, the candle is really one of the only creations, material creations, that can give, can give, can give, and will not be depleted, even one iota. One candle can light a thousand other lights and still retain the same potency. And so without further ado, if we could look at it just for a moment, and we won't go through the whole thing, but the idea of the spirituality assessment is because very often we don't take the time to ask ourselves questions. And we don't take the time to challenge ourselves with thought-provoking sort of queries that compel us to encounter aspects and spheres of our own self that we don't necessarily bump into on our everyday life experience. You know, there was a Nobel Prize laureate, Isidore Rabi, won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And uh, when they asked him, why do you think you, out of all the kids in your class who were all bright, won the Nobel Prize? What led you to such a celebrated path in science? He said, well, every other kid, when we would all come home from school, our moms would all greet us and say, what great teaching did your teacher teach you today? My mom was different, and she asked me, what great question did you ask today? And that's really what this assessment's about. It's about asking ourselves important questions. And I'll just go through a few of them. And if we have time later on, it would be very interesting for folks in the audience to answer these questions. But the first one is, who's the most spiritual person in your life, and what makes them so spiritual? And the reason I love that question is because very often we regurgitate a lot of slogans, or statements that we've heard, we've processed, and we've sort of identified with in a very default way. But when asked the question in a little bit of a different way, sometimes you can see based on who that person might be, and when you unpack it and say, why is that person spiritual, that can help you understand a little bit about your own associations and definitions of what spirituality looks like. Now, if you all do this exercise with me just for a moment, a very quick moment, I want you all to imagine yourself meeting somebody for the first time, and you have about a minute or two to describe yourself. So you only have time to say two or three things about yourself. What might that be? Let's all do this for a second, right? Imagine you're meeting somebody for the first time. What are you going to say about yourself? OK. You have that somewhere and you're in the recesses of your mind. And now I want to ask you to answer the second question, which is what do you want to be remembered for? Would you say that the two match up, the way you described yourself and the way you want to be remembered? Mm -hmm. Sometimes yes, but sometimes no. Mm -hmm. And then some of the other questions, like what are you most proud of? And what are your biggest regrets? almost invariably our biggest regrets are not about lost pleasure opportunities, right. but more about meaningful experiences that could have happened. Mm -hmm. And especially when it comes to what we're most proud of, it's typically not about the greatest dinner we've had or the greatest ride in the amusement park, right? But more about the deeper and meaningful things. And if we have time, we'll get to some of the others later on. But that's a little bit about some of the important questions which can become interventions mm -hmm. when we seek to understand and encounter the spirituality latent within us. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Uh, okay, so our second question is for Dr. Wendy and Dr. Armbadar. In both your research and practice, have you found that there's a useful way to know when and how to bring spirituality into treatment. Joan, do you wanna go first? Sure, um, I think that there's no right or wrong answer to this. I think one of the things about this topic that brought, brought my awareness up or just thinking about it more is that I think we have to, it's a good idea to more routinely think of 
spirituality as an essential component of treatment. Similar to, I was talking with some of my colleagues and seeing there was a patient that was saying, no, I'm not gonna do family therapy, I'm not gonna do family therapy, I'm not gonna do family therapy. And I sort of say, well, would you tell the person that they don't have to see the psychiatrist? Would you tell the person they don't have to do individual therapy? No, the family therapy is as much of a component of treatment as anything. And I think spirituality in, in this, just being invited to do this, it sort of brought me to that like place of that it should be always you know, considered as an important modality of treatment that can be utilized to help people you know, through their painful life experiences. And I think the most important thing is just to not have your own agenda about it, that it's really keeping in mind that you're, it's about connecting with a patient and them being able to be in touch with their authentic self. But I think it can start by questions like this to get to know what their spiritual foundation is and how they think it may or may not be helpful to them and is it overlooked in some way. And certainly when you're treating you know, eating disorders and addictions and anybody who's experiencing pain, I mean, one of the things about spirituality is that it broadens your perspective on things. Like these questions really are tied into having perspective on life and what your values are. So in any situation with somebody who's having any type of psychic pain, a dose of perspective is always in order. And, uh, and being more in touch with, like you talked about, what we call our soul, whatever that may be. Um, we know when we have that inner messenger inside of us that's saying something in our life isn't really mm -hmm. adding up to our values. We just a lot of times don't like what that means. And so p helping people be able to listen to that is, is really, really important. And s helping people see when there's an incongruence um, and so however that person has approached spirituality is really the starting point uh, and not having an agenda about it. But considering it a fundamental part of treatment in all cases as a, as a starting point, I think will elevate um, all the work that we do. I think it's overlooked. Thank you. Wow. No, no. I definitely agree with, agree with that. Um, you know, it's a little bit different in my practice because I kind of I'm the happiness happiness psychiatrist, so it's mm -hmm. kind of obvious that I'm taking you know a slightly different approach. So I think the patients that come to me are already a little bit more open to exploring kind of their spiritual side. Um, it's really case dependent, though. You know, you don't, as you said, you don't want to push it on anyone. You don't want to mm -hmm. have an agenda. So. And then in some ways it's about semantics, right? Because you could argue that everything we do as psychiatrists and therapists is deeply spiritual. You know, I think as clinicians, we give patients permission to be who they are. Um, we make it okay to be who they are. And I think that's actually, I don't think there's anything more spiritual than that. So whether you call it spirituality or you just call it a therapy session, you know, I think it's all spiritual. Um, but in terms of when do you bring it up, I think that I've found in patients who have present with depression or anxiety or self-esteem issues, often there is a sense of emptiness. There's a sense of, you know, there's a void there. And I think that if we can talk about, you know, hey, what's, what's this emptiness about? You know, maybe spirituality can help that. Um, maybe meditating can help you gain some insights about who you are as a person. So it's very individual, um, but I do think there's kind of a, a lot of emptiness um, that I think spirituality could really help. Um, anxiety as well, you know, meditation is not easy. It's not something that, you know, you just wanna tell somebody who's very anxious, we'll just go meditate, mm -hmm. because it's not so easy. And, and I definitely recognize that. Um, I think in my sessions, you know, we even just meditate for like a minute or two. And that's so helpful. Like people literally, you can see them coming down from the anxiety mm -hmm. in just a minute or two. So I take a very broad approach to spirituality. So I think that it's, you know, whether you explicitly say, okay, today our session, we're going to talk about spirituality. Whether you say that explicitly or not, it's, it's kind of always there. Um, and then the other thing I really wanted to mention is intuition. Mm -hmm. um, I think intuition is such a beautiful, important thing in our world. And I don't think we talk about it enough. We don't honor it enough. We don't give people permission to listen to their intuition enough. And I think that if we, if we can give that to our patients, if we can give that to ourselves, um, 
you know, we have the answers inside. We know kind of on a deeper soul level what, what we need. And sometimes the therapist just facilitates you recognizing what you already kind of know inside. Um, so I always recommend to patients, if they're open to it, to keep an intuition journal mm. where they just kind of write down what, what intuitions they have. And then, you know, we can come back to it six months later and say, was any of this correct? Were you accurate? Mm -hmm. And surprisingly, you know, people, people are quite accurate when they review their intuition mm -hmm. journal. So they kind of knew, knew what was going on. So I think it's once again, giving people permission, um, to listen to their own soul, to their own spirit. And mm -hmm. that I think is, is spirituality. Um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, mm -hmm. I would say it can really help patients with depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. get to know who they really are. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, so our next question is, how might a lack of basic existential validation, in other words, the idea that we are valuable and worthy just because we exist, underlie a lot of psychological ailments? If so, how can that validation be integrated into treatment? JD, would you like to take this first? Sure. Um, I'll just start off by saying that the term existential validation itself might not be uh, as common or as popular as, uh, as, as we're just referencing it, but if we go back a little bit historically to the early origins of Western society, the early underpinnings of Rome and Greece, there were certain cultural foundations which sort of seeped its way into our psyches and we take for granted. Whether it's the Colosseum, whether it's the Roman architecture, whether it's the intellectual prowess of the philosophers of Greece, where they had an entire elitist society of those who excelled with what Aristotle called the active intellect, creating what in their minds were a higher form of humanity. There is definitely a persistent theme that those who have greater achievements and accomplishments are put on a higher pedestal in society. Mm -hmm. Whether it's aesthetically, or the, the, their physique, athletically, or whether academically, intellectually, or whether financially. And that's where, even until today, so many of us identify with people, places, or things, confuse net worth with self-worth, mm -hmm. and we use that as the basis for why we matter, mm -hmm. right? Mark Twain famously said that the most, two most important days of a person's life is the day you were born and the day you figure out why. So that why mm -hmm. is existential, it's not cosmetic. It's the fact that you exist, why do you exist? And because that's such a powerful question at the very core of our existence, if we don't have a satisfactory answer every single day, it's going to create tremendous untold chaos and turmoil. And we might not see that turmoil until it expresses itself in a lot of unhealthy behaviors. You know, there was a, um, a celebrated author, C.S. Lewis, who was once attending a, a party of a very wealthy hedge fund manager. And the hedge fund manager turns to him and he says, jokingly, I make more in one month than all of your books combined. And what C.S. Lewis responded was, yes, but I have something that you will never have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he's curious. He says, no, that can't be. <laughs> he says, I do. He says, what is it? He says, enough. Mm -hmm. And that's part of, at Montier, what we seek to mm -hmm. convey and communicate. Um, you know, many years ago, when I was visiting prisons across Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, doing some chaplain work, there was a story that they shared, which was uh, that in some Russian prison, many, many years ago, it was illegal to uh, gamble. And the prisoners, of course, gambled. And when the guard would come in, he would search the entire cell. And he would search it meticulously. But he was never able to find the cards. And the reason he was never able to find the cards is because they hid it in the one place he would never think to search, his own pocket. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the things that we're trying to convey and communicate is that when you're looking in so many different directions, 
for this type of validation, mm -hmm. for something to justify your existence, but it's really in your pocket all along. And that's one of the beautiful gifts of spirituality, to be able to recognize that our existential validation is intrinsic and we are not glorious because of our achievements and accomplishments, but rather our achievements and accomplishments are only possible because of that inner glory that we inherently possess. And just to conclude with a thought from the Hebrew language, in the Hebrew language, the word for holy is kodesh. And the word for mundane is chol. But the word chol also means sand. And the word kodesh also means rooted. So one of the key distinctions between spirituality and mundane hedonism is how rooted are you and how easy is it to blow away in the wind like sand? And you see this resiliency when people are plugged into their own spirituality and have this inner appreciation for the inner wealth that they possess, that even when the going gets rough, there is a deep reservoir of strength that we can always fall back on. And that is a profound gift that sometimes people only encounter in treatment for the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, they come because of a precipitating circumstance that leads them to uh, you know, a very poor sense of functionality. So just imagine like they're coming because there's a leak. You hire a plumber to fix your, your leak and then you discover that there's mold in the ceiling so we have to tear open the ceiling and you tear more and more open until you figure out that the structure of the whole building is not sound <laughs> and they demo it and then you find an oil field underneath, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. they're coming because of this symptom and that symptom but hopefully when they walk away they have an increased sense of appreciation and awareness and potential for themselves to discover their why and encounter their inner wealth. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So I'm just being mindful of time. Oh. <laughs> mindful of time. We have a couple more questions too that kind of interconnect. If, if you'd like, you're okay, I jump to the next one and start with both of you, okay. So do you feel that a sense of connection to spirituality and to finding meaning and purpose is especially appropriate and relevant in these times? Mm -hmm. Why or why not? Who would like to go first? Should I go? Oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, we were talking about this before together that, you know, in today's day and age, there's so many more ways to feel inadequate nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, just with social media, with global interconnectivity, you know, 200 years ago, you were living in your village and you interacted with your neighbor in the village, right? Um, but now, you know, you you get on social media and you see so many, so many people. So I think that absolutely uh, in the modern world, it's even more important to be grounded. And I really liked what you said about rootedness mm -hmm. um, because I think um, spirituality can really ground you. It can really help you feel a sense of um, I'm solid inside, right? So things are gonna change in the outside world, external things come and go. But if you're really grounded in something deeper, your own soul, um, it's really a source of deep strength. Um, so absolutely, in, in our modern world, I think that we need it more than ever. We need to take some time out from all the gadgets and the gizmos mm -hmm. and just say, hey, I'm going to take five minutes to just breathe deeply. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very simple. Um, but I think it's so uh, rejuvenating, absolutely. I, I agree. I think that... Um the way our society is set up, I think if there were some aliens that came down and take a look at us, and <laughs> they would say, what on earth are they thinking? Um, I'll give an example, you know, in addition to social media, just kids with the expectations kids have, and why is it that kids have to go to school all day, and then they have to do after school activities, and then they have to get home, then they do have to do homework. So we, we sort of create a routine that's sort of normative that really does not really put people in touch with their spirituality or their intrinsic soul or uh, whatever language we want to use for it, but just being in touch with their true self. And I think that one of the ways I use, one of the, some of the terms I use with my patients is that some of the people that I work with I think are really good and competent at a lot of things that society expects out of them and then they get a lot of social reinforcement for being good at the things that society expects 
out of them. And there's this process, what I call it, you're addicted to external hoop jumping. You've just become so acclimated to getting the reinforcement from the outside that the plumbing from within isn't really getting cultivated. So I think about like one of my patients that is just really, really bright and was like an advanced reading in first grade and like was really athletic and all of this. And, and she did not, there was so much reinforcement of all these actions that wasn't connected to her soul that she just got lost. She didn't know what was inside of her. When you talk about existential validation, she didn't know the beauty of what was within her. And so it's very powerful getting those likes on social media or the grades Ooh. or the school and you know the prestigious school, et cetera. I mean, and people can get very hooked into that and really detracted from themselves. And it's normalized in our society. It's, it's really not a lot of attention is put into that you know, inner search or the validation of, of the authentic self. Um, I'll just say I'm really proud of my, my, my daughter. She's getting ready to graduate from law school and she's one of those people that did a lot of external hoop jumping, but she sent me a message this morning and she's not taking like the big job with the big corporation in New York. She's, she's sending me a message telling me how, how little money she's making after she gets out of law school. And I said, I am so happy because you're doing the thing that you feel compelled to do and excited to do. So um, that's kind of Absolutely. something that makes me excited to see people being able to recognize what's inside is really the treasure and the value that, that you're talking about. I just want to add one thing. Mm -hmm. When you were talking about your patient, it mm -hmm. reminded me of one of my very first patients mm -hmm. when I started my private practice like 10 years ago. And I'm not going to reveal any identifying mm -hmm. information, um, but he had won this big entertainment award. Mm -hmm. I mean, amazing. You'd mm -hmm. be so proud of yourself. You're working years to achieve this. And he literally came in and he was so depressed. Mm -hmm. He was so sad. And it was just, it was such a good lesson for me too, just mm -hmm. seeing that you can win all the accolades, you can mm -hmm. win all the awards, and that doesn't mean it's going to make you happy. It's right. not, I mean, I was just such a stark example. I'm like, mm -hmm. you won this amazing award and you always wanted to win this <laughs> award and you're not happy. You're really depressed actually. So I just think it's so important to cultivate that inner sense of I'm okay mm -hmm. if I win an award, I'm okay if I don't win the award. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. But you know, I just wa I just want to point out what you're saying. When people talk about a midlife crisis, mm -hmm. so there's so many ways that people could have a midlife crisis, and there's so many ages that you could have a midlife crisis. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it, and and it really happens in both extremes. It happens when you haven't achieved what you've been pursuing for so many years, and it finally hits you. You may never. Mm. So that sort of a mm -hmm. uh, target for validation that was supposed to be the answer to what makes us feel relevant and important mm -hmm. might be out of our reach. But then it also happens on the other side when <laughs> you actually reach what yeah. you were pursuing all along and then you say, Oops. <laughs> really? You know, I think it was, um, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said that so many people spend their lives climbing the ladder of success only to realize once they've reached the top that it was facing the wrong wall. Mm. Mm -hmm. So that could be another you know, source for midlife Absolutely. crisis. And I think somebody else said another saying was, many men spend their entire lives searching for fish, like trying to fish, mm -hmm. not realizing it's not fish that they're after. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the right. same thing. You know, maybe yeah. that's not going right. to do it for you in the end. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, that means we actually have time for another question. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, that's great. So this one is uh, for Dr. Wendy and Dr. Ambedar. Are there scientific studies that have shown physiological changes to the brain as a result of spiritual practices and interventions? Sure. It's been only about 30 years since I took my last neur neurology <laughs> test, but... Um, <laughs> but um, but this is really, really fascinating to me to think about the neurobiological correlates of what spirituality really is. So there's a lot that's written about a lot of the studies that are done on the brain changes as tied into spirituality are actually done on people in states of uh, meditation. 
but um, there is something called the default mode neural network. Again, I, it's been a while, so, uh, um, but this is really, really fascinating. This default mode neural network is really the neurobiological basis for the concept of the self, if you read about it. And there's this network of the brain, in the brain, where you have the prefrontal cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex, the precuneus, and the medial temporal lobe that are all like interconnected. And this is really the part of our brain that's sort of can tied in to the experiences that we might call spirituality. And when, when you, what's very interesting when you read, uh, when you think about what these parts of the brain encompass, the, the temporal lobe and the hippocampus is tied into perceptions of beauty and processing of affect and emotion. Uh, the precuneus has about 60 functions when you, when you read about it, but among those that I thought were very interesting and worth noting is memory and integration of information. Of course, the prefrontal cortex is the cognitive control, cognitive flexibility, impulse control, and then the cingulate cortex is the process, what's really interesting to me about this part of the brain, it's the process of emotion and behavior, but also autonomic function. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about like the things that we're doing in meditation or yoga or just like breathing, breathing is so amazing. I mean, you, you, you can, why do we say <laughs> breathe? You know, like if you take a deep breath, like if we just take a breath in, you know, <sighs> Our, our nervous system is affected by that. So this, this default mode neural net, network is part of what's going on for us when we're entering a state of transcendence or spirituality. And that just kind of blows my mind. Um, some of the other things that are really interesting about that is that it is through reduc reduction of the activation that you have the more access to the spiritual, spiritual realm. Um, that's also noted in, in meditation. And things that bring that on include altruism. So the act of altruism actually affects our brain in this way. Meditation affects our brain in this way. Prayer affects our brain in this way. And guess what? Psychedelics can also mm -hmm. affect our brain in this way. So this is something that, you know, is there was a talk about um, psychedelics and trauma, which is like kind of like, the, the new generation, I missed the talk, unfortunately, but these are different ways to uh, decrease this, um, this neural network that's tied in with spirituality. So it's just, that just kind of blows my mind when I, when I think about the, the, the neurobiology of spirituality. There's a lot, a lot to be read about this, and um, the, this, one of the most interesting studies involved, um, actually it was about 90,000 people that they studied and, and were able to identify these parts of the brain. And they used meditation as sort of the way to um, kind of access what they called spirituality. Absolutely. Wow. I'll just add a little bit to mm -hmm. that because I think you covered a lot of ground there. Um, you know, there have been studies now for at least 20 years, I think since like 2000, in the early 2000s, that have shown that meditation actually changes your brain. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the amygdala, which is the fear and anxiety center of the brain, shrinks. Uh, the hippocampus, which is the learning and memory center of the brain, thickens. Uh, the temporoparietal junction, which is kind of the empathy center of the brain, thickens. So these are real observable physiological changes in your brain, mm -hmm. um, which is not hard to believe if we view the brain as a muscle, right? And when you exercise a muscle through meditation or yoga or any other spiritual practice, it's going to get stronger and you're going to observe you know, physical changes. Um, and I think a lot of the studies have been done with meditators, and they've shown that in the left prefrontal cortex, when that area lights up, it generally means that the test subject is happier or is feeling more joy. So people who meditate more, they found that their left prefrontal cortex actually just lights up a lot more mm -hmm. on fMRIs and EEGs. And then when you're depressed, your right prefrontal cortex tends to light up more with activity. Mm -hmm. um, and 
you see more activity on the right side in patients that are depressed or maybe aren't engaging in treatment for their mental health issues. Um, so I just, I think it's fascinating that we can observe these changes yeah. in the brain. There's been preliminary studies now on yoga as well. Um, not, as, not as many studies have been done on yoga as have been done on meditation, but with yoga as well, they've shown that the gray matter volume in the brain actually grows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm when you do yoga, which I think is fascinating, so. Wonderful, thank you, everyone. So we just have a bit of time left. We have a, a wonderful question, but I think what I'd like to do, if you're all, you know, agree with me, we'll open it up for some questions. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, we have about eight minutes. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Obviously, each panelist here is open for a question. Questions or comments. Or right? comments, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think Renee's grabbing a mic. Thank you, Renee. If we could just take a moment and uh, applaud Renee for what a wonderful <laughs> conference. Wow. The, the thoughtfulness to so many of the myriads of details to making something so spectacular and beautiful. Really, really thank you. Mm -hmm. And Renee is the calmest <laughs> conference planner I have ever experienced <laughs> in my life. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> All right. So does anybody have any questions or comments? Renee's got the microphone. Come on, guys. There was, there was a question over, over here. Uh, th I just want to thank you for bringing this topic up, and we really enjoyed hearing what you guys had to say, and it's such an important component of the work we all do, and I feel very just moved by a lot of things I heard, and I also want to say the food was amazing. That was the best sandwich. <laughs> I don't know where you got that, but that's all, but thanks so much. Thank you. Did you? Okay. All right. Renee, over In the front. No, no. No, no. Say who you are. Yeah. Over here, Renee. Over here, Renee. In the, oh, oh. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you, all three of you. That was wonderful. I was wondering when you are working with folks who are initially even skeptic to the idea of spirituality, you know, what are simple things that, that help you get to, I guess, a halfway point mm -hmm. or that next step towards the direction where they can open their mind to that sort of concept? <laughs> I, I can, we I, have uh, 30 seconds for that. I can, say, I can say something quickly about that, and I think it goes back to the idea of focusing on behavior because we, it's hard to just, you can't will yourself into like feeling, you can't like snap, snap your fingers. You can go to bed, but you can't necessarily sleep. You can't just be forced into feeling spiritual. But when we talk about things that lead towards that transcendent or that whatever we want to call it, the decrease of the, you know, the, mo the, the brain activities, what, whatever we want to tie it to, it's the behavior. So I use this motto, CTLB, so it's choose a loving behavior. And so helping people think about like, what's loving kindness towards yourself? What's loving kindness towards others? And be thinking along those lines so that you're not like kind of trying to shove any dogma, you know, into a person's way, but I sort of say to my patients, like, well, does it do any harm to add more love into the universe? Like, right. I can't see any reason why we, why we shouldn't at least put some energy into that. And by helping people, like, kind of think of themselves in sometimes an, altru an altruistic way or think about being more compassionate toward themselves or others, um, these are things that can help, I think, go in the direction without, like, any kind of dogma that you're pushing upon someone. Um, did you, you want to, you had, yeah. Like, oh. Like, uh oh. You, Mike is coming, Fiona. He almost burst. You're going to ask another question. I'll say it again. Uh, that was kind of my question. Uh -huh. uh, same thing about resistance or even, I thought this was a really 
beautiful example of talking about the range of spirituality from religion and faith and prayer mm -hmm. to science and the brain to compassion mm -hmm. and self-compassion and that idea of resistance, which someone mm -hmm. just asked was what I was curious about, or even more so um, people who have a really hard time unpacking the more neutral or secular definitions of spirituality and just really associate it more with that sort of faith-based religious piece and where there might be some trauma around that. Mm -hmm. um, the other area is yeah. music. The mu music is a very important area of, in my view, being more connected to your soul or higher power. I mean, I, I have kids that are raised Christian from Nigeria and I, I go to church with them and man, when that music is playing and we're all in there together and you raise your hand like that, something is happening mm -hmm. in that space. And I, that gives me comfort again around the idea of spirituality because something happens when we're connected by music as well mm -hmm. that's transcendent. And so if somebody's very resistant to like a concrete definition of spirituality, it's like, Let's, let's, let's think about music. Let's listen yeah, to some music right. together. So Absolutely. another tool. And I think another good way, because I've had many patients who are actually quite resistant, like I'll mm -hmm. say, hey, do you want to meditate? They're like, no, <laughs> do not want to meditate. Um, so I found that just talking about gut instinct, mm -hmm. you know, gut instinct is something that everyone can relate to. Intuition is something that many people can relate to. So when you kind of come at it from the gut instinct, you know, what should I do, Dr. Ambradar? Well, what does your intuition tell you? What does your gut instinct tell you? Let's let's tune in. So that might be a way to kind of get in there. Um, another good way is, um, I was going to say, what was the other way I do? Oh, yeah, self-compassion. Mm -hmm. I think talking about compassion, you know, a lot of patients are actually very compassionate to other people. They're very caring, very giving, maybe too giving. <laughs> um, and so talking about the self-compassion piece, the self-love piece, I think that kind of can get you into that spiritual mm -hmm. feel as well. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you. We just have a minute left. JD, would you like to close us out? Just a minute. That went so fast. I know. I know. I know. <laughs> An hour for such a big topic is, <laughs> is uh, I, I could listen to JD talk for a really long yeah, time. Yeah, that's why I was thinking he could close us out here with just some, some words of wisdom. I mean, I think the only thing I really would love to conclude with is the, uh, the idea that today more than ever, spirituality would seem to be the direction to foster brotherhood and uh, uh, not just a sense of tolerance, but more than tolerance, an appreciation for the unique indispensability of each and every individual. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's a, a beautiful line that my rabbi once shared with me, and it was basically, birth is God's way of telling you that the world cannot continue to exist without you. <laughs> and if we really believe in that, then we, it presupposes our, our validation and what we're here for and, what, and, and, and the fact that every day is an opportunity and that you know, just gives us a spring. It gives us a, a, a motivation to, to want to live, mm -hmm. not just to be passive, but to be proactive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the 12 steps, right? Everybody talk, talks about the 12 steps. I, you know, the 12 steps is really one of the first movements that brought spirituality without a religion necessarily, without any of the dogma that traumatized a lot of people and compromised or, or obscured their relationship with spirituality. And it just brought so many of the important principles like connection and believing in something bigger than oneself. Mm -hmm. And you see every conceivable disorder has its own 12-step support group. It's not just about addiction. And in a, in a way, it really destigmatized mental health. I mean, mm -hmm. 50 years ago, if somebody said you go to a shrink or a therapist, oh, there was a stigma. Mm -hmm. And today, you talk to somebody, and it's like, what? You don't see a therapist? You're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but a lot of that had to do with the fact that there was, you know, the, the, the camaraderie and the, 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 the healing taking place by joining arms and, you know, humanity being strongest when we're unified. You mm -hmm. think, you know, you just think about this. If I can carry 100 pounds and you can carry 100 pounds, the science says that together we can carry a lot more than 200. Mm -hmm. And I think that more than ever, um, is 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 really something that is so so relevant, so timely, and a little bit of light can banish a lot of darkness. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time.
All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Lauren, for thank you. moderating. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. <laughs> wow, we were very timely. Good, and that was fast. It went so 